coming up next for the next session talking on the intersection of bitcoin and human rights i really want to watch this panel session for the next 20 minutes i'll be leaving in the hands of the moderator juliet kanjukia a lot of applause for them ladies and gentlemen good afternoon everyone how are you feeling today good all right my name is juliet kanjukia i come from save the children all the way from nairobi kenya and I am part of the global innovation team that manages partnerships and projects in blockchain, Bitcoin, and AI. And today, what a better panel to discuss about the intersection of Bitcoin and human rights, which is essentially what you do, like you've heard from my colleague. So in this world that is really plagued by all the crises and the problems that we are facing, how do we keep the hope alive in the midst of problems that really do not influence us or give us hope to um, give up. So allow me to introduce the panel today. Um, Cassia, please welcome on stage. A round of applause, please. <laughs> Next on is Meron Estefanos. Last but not least, I would like to welcome Alex Gladstein from the Human Rights Foundation. So in less than a minute, please, each one of you, I'd like for you to tell me, give us one reason. What do you do outside of your work that helps you deal with the problems or at least give you a break out of the crisis and the problems that we face in humanity? Cassia. Uh, can you repeat, sorry? What do I one, do outside? One thing you like to do to give you relief outside of the human crisis that we're currently facing. Oh, I'm a singer. My band is called Autonomia. We want to spread autonomy through art. And I'm also a part of Bitcoin Film Fest. And that's what I do outside of work. All right. Meron? Sorry, I didn't hear What is one fun thing you do outside of your work that gives you relief out of the crisis and the problems that we face? Music, dancing okay. and working out is the most fun thing I know. All right. Alex? <clears throat> it's a great question. Uh, sometimes the... Uh, struggle can get pretty dark out there. Um, but uh, aside from the inspiration I get from all the uh, amazing uh, people I work with and the people in, in this community in particular, uh, aside from spending time with my family, um, I, I like uh, being in the, in the water, in the ocean. Uh, I learned how to surf recently. That's been really fun. So I think I would say that that's helping center me a lot. Great. Yeah. So I do hope that all of us in the audience have got something that gives us a break because that's part of what we do as humanity. And so I'll delve straight into the questions. We do know that technology really has got a lot of design baked into its values and vice versa, right? But it's only recently that we have started seeing or shaping technology to suit human purpose. So Cassia, I would want to begin with you. Why Bitcoin? Why did the Open Dialogue Foundation choose Bitcoin? And what is your coalition, the BTC coalition, doing to advance Bitcoin and the blockchain um, technology? Um, so some of you know our story, but really briefly, <clears throat> Open Dialogue Foundation is a human rights advocacy group. So for the last 14 years, we have been uh, monitoring the state of human rights, especially individual uh, individual political persecution and then reporting this data to policymakers, to decision makers. Uh, and now at some point in our history we were debunked in Brussels, Belgium, so at the heart, in, at the heart of Europe really. And well, a hurdle at first uh, to put it lightly, but it turned out to be serendipitous because we discovered Bitcoin and ever since we utilize Bitcoin to protect human rights. Uh, we try to scale Bitcoin for human rights. Uh, we delivered humanitarian aid to Ukraine with it. We try to educate our fellow travelers in the human rights world. And we formed, and this is a big shout out to Alex, who was instrumental in building our informal uh, building through change, BTC, if you will, coalition. Uh, we had a group of freedom fighters really across the world but also industry leaders and practitioners and educators and our mission is to to knock on believe me knock on every single possible door we can to educate policymakers about bitcoin being the humanitarian force thanks cassia and really this brings to mind the quality of presence our lived and shared human experiences and so meron i will come right to you 
because yours tends to be a use case of Bitcoin, especially in the humanitarian world. So you've started the Bitcoin Innovation Hub in Kampala. Could you tell us what impact have you had on improving the livelihoods of the refugee communities and also some of the marginalized communities within that region? <clears throat> Well, uh, as a refugee advocate, as an activist uh, who has been avo advocating for refugees, I notice uh, majority refugees, they live on remittance sent by their family members elsewhere, and they don't have IDs, and they, they are unbanked. So for them, the only way to receive money is using Hawala. Uh, and also, I mean, like in the case of kidnapping of refugees. That's how I got into by paying ransoms within an hour because when someone gets kidnapped and, and is sold, so you have an hour to pay money. And, and it used to be very hard for me like to pay $40,000 ransom within an hour. Like money gram is 7,500, Western Union is 4,500. So when I was orange peeled by Alex Gladstein and heard about Bitcoins and I suddenly saw how it can impact um, especially for, for the work that I do. And, and now, thanks to Bitcoin, I can wire money within less than an hour. The people can receive their, their money. But as for the Bitcoin Innovation Hub, uh, we so far, we have uh, just last week, 175 students graduated. Uh, so we teach six uh, different skill trainings at, at the hub. Uh, we focus on vulnerable groups, uh, single mothers, um, so we teach them skills and with the skills, so we, there are two mandatory classes that we have, which is financial literacy and, and Bitcoin education. So for example, if we, if, if we teach a woman how to sew clothing, and, but she doesn't know how to sell it, so the financial literacy class teaches on how you sell your merchandise online and how you can accept Bitcoin payments using Bitcoin. So that's, that's basically what we're doing and, and I, I believe that we have impacted at least 175 refugee lives and, and we hope to do that more in the coming years. Great, thanks Miron. Really, it also just amplifies the reference that we have technology for good. And so I'll come to you, Alex. You know, we have, or we are in this evolution of technology and we have increasingly been seeing the breaking of social contracts between the builders and the users that we are building for or the communities that we want to reach. And so we have this problem now of building trust at scale. And in the context of Bitcoin, we are now seeing that it has been technically considered a threat to democracy as well. So in your books, sometimes um, you've addressed that political landscape as well. Could you, or rather, how do you see the Bitcoin community working with legislators and governments um, to come up with a regulatory framework that safeguards human rights, but also perhaps at the same time, maybe reassuring them that you know, we are not against you. Yeah, I mean, I think that, um, uh, well, first of all, thanks, thanks for having me. Um, I, I'm not sure that uh, engaging with the government is gonna be a complete solution. I think that in democratic societies, it's, it's worth doing and it's worth supporting groups like the Open Dialogue Foundation and in the United States, uh, the Bitcoin Policy Institute, because at the end of the day, democratic societies can be pressured uh, and things can change in the United States. For example, in my country, there are senators and congressmen and women and governors who are now pro-Bitcoin. There are legislators, there are heads of agencies who are now pro-Bitcoin, and that's gonna make it a lot harder for the executive branch or the military to just decide one day that we're gonna be against Bitcoin. Um, that being said, most people in the world don't have the uh, privilege of having a, a democratic society with rules and norms at all. 70% of the world's population or more live under some sort of authoritarian regime where there's not gonna be any kind of back and forth. There's not gonna be any kind of democratic accountability. So, you know, I think that we need to uh, build uh, and, uh, you know, uh, without permission and, you know, you ask for forgiveness later. Like this is how the entire Bitcoin construct was generated out of the cypherpunk movement. They were not interested in uh, asking the government for permission to do something. They had to go out and build privacy technology in the early 90s, uh, despite what the government wanted. Right. Um, and that's why we have things like Signal today. That's why we have things like VPNs. That's why we have things uh, like the Tor network, all these things that we use, uh, is because people built them without, without asking for permission. So I think that's the best ethos, and we have to do it, because the current system is so broken. I mean, it's comically broken. 
you have 180 currencies, Africa has 45 currencies, they are all in varying degrees of disintegration and disrepair. You have one currency that's basically used at the global level for energy, trade, finance. You have a couple other currencies that are sort of interchangeable with that dollar, you know, maybe the euro, maybe the Chinese currency. But most of these currencies are not convertible on international markets. They can't be used to buy oil or fertilizer or tractors or uh, uranium or anything that a nation needs to, 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 to grow. Uh, and these nations are forced to exchange uh, or, or to, to, to do trade with the US or Europe or, or China or whatever to get a better currency. And it totally ruins the way that they architect their economies. At the same time, you have such injustice in terms of uh, you know, nations in Europe still controlling the currencies of many African nations. You have uh, countries like Cuba that run a system where uh, they basically hyperinflate the uh, wage technology that's earned by public sector workers. Uh, and then they force you, if you want to go buy something like meat or fuel, you have to get what are called MLCs, which are like a government credit, and you can only get them by having your family from abroad send hard foreign currency to the country, which the government harvests and then gives you this credit. And that's where we're headed with CBDCs, is like governments controlling how much uh, petrol or beef you can have um, and forcing you to use like inferior goods and services. And then you have I mean, there's so many currency injustices. I mean, you have people, I mean, the Palestinians have to use the Israeli currency. I mean, there's so many issues like this. So the world desperately needs one single unified non-political currency. Um, whether we see it take over the world, we don't know. But obviously in our work as activists, it's been a very useful tool and it's something that we want to share with more people. Right. Yes, Cassia. I just don't know. Oh, okay, okay, it works. If I may just jump in. Um, uh, referring back to your question and to what Alex said, I totally agree. Let's just keep the good fight. We don't need to ask for permission. Uh, and the world of policy maker will, with the incentive building the systems, like it will never catch up with the human innovation. Um, but I wanted to share a few stories from our work. So we had cases of, for example, I don't know, I was at a conference a, at, Lion, at the Lions then, if you will, at a conference of central bankers uh, who, were, who are responsible for drafting CBDCs. And they obviously didn't do a proper research on me by inviting me there, but um, but after my speech, I had actually central bankers coming to me and at least saying like, okay, I didn't have a clue that Bitcoin has such humanitarian application. So a lot of them are, are totally in the unknown. We had also politicians who we met who were, you know, from hardcore like socialist um, front and that made them naturally hostile towards Bitcoin. And then we discovered that they were, for example, debunked themselves because of uh, sending money, for example, to political prisoners in Turkey. And then, oddly enough, they turned out to be our biggest supporters to fight against, uh, for example, abuse of, uh, of, um, of anti-money laundering regulations. Um, but why it is important to us, uh, just a quick defense, why it is important to us also to work on this front, you know, whether we like it or not, uh, the rea our reality is that on many fronts we rely on those policymakers, right? Like, for example, in our defense of political prisoners, we need their support. And we cannot afford to have politicians, uh, for example, right now the European Union is again launching an attack on Bitcoin mining, calling it environmentally helpful, harmful to climate, an energy wasting mechanism. We cannot afford politicians to call the instrument we use to safeguard human rights in such a hostile and untruthful language. So we will keep our fight to debunk this. Thanks, Cassia. And in closing, we've got just four minutes to go. What I hear from both Alex and Cassia is that we are in some of the decisive decade of the 2000s between bridging technology and what we are experiencing across humanity. And so quickly, in your specific or your particular areas of work, Give me one key challenge that you have experienced and maybe one possible solution that we can all work, including with developers, to bridge that um, gap. Apart, besides the policymakers and everything, so now let's go grassroots, right? Because we are building for the people that we want to empower. Uh, 
I think I, because again, like I'm, I'm an activist. Uh, we rely on your support as ec experts. So I, I think I would like to turn this into a question to you. So for example, our worry is, for example, are we prepared for the worst regulatory situation uh, towards peer-to-peer -to -peer and uh, self-custody wallets? So for example, if a Bitcoin wallets app disappear from, are banned from Apple and Google, our question to you guys is, how are we gonna find you? One minute, Maron, Maron, please. I mean, there are so many challenges, I can't even. <laughs> um, the challenges is, first of all, like, you know, having a Bitcoin Innovation Hub, it was thanks to HRF's funding that we were able to open. Uh, finding funding is one of the most challenging thing that we are facing, uh, at least for the Bitcoin Innovation Hub. Uh, and also, you know, teaching people about Bitcoin has been like the hardest thing in Africa. Ever since I moved to Africa, last year, uh, whenever I try to teach people about Bitcoin, then everyone is like, but Bitcoin is a scam. So because a lot of people have been scammed by people, yeah, yeah. so it's really hard to convince people. And then once you give them why it's good for the person, like why in his life or in your life, and then suddenly it makes sense. They'll be like, oh, I didn't know, but I, I gave a lot of money. I sold my house. One woman told me she sold her house to invest in Bitcoin, but the people never gave her her coins. And, and we had at the hub, the funny thing is like one man came with, with a picture of Bitcoin, thinking that he owns one Bitcoin. He came to our hub and said, I would like to sell my Bitcoin. We're like, but this is a picture of Bitcoin. This is not the actual Bitcoin. So there's a lot of scam in Africa. So I think that's the challenging part. All right, Alex. Sure, look, I think without question, medium to long term, Bitcoin needs to improve and we need to continue to support open source developers. I mean, today we have no clear roadmap to making sure that all 8 billion people in the world have a UTXO, have real self-custody over Bitcoin. That being said, I'm pretty sure we're going to get there. Like, people come up with incredible solutions, and I think over the next decade, we will find ways to give access to real financial freedom to everyone. Um, in the meantime, what's a much bigger challenge, is, as, as, as has been laid out, is uh, basically education and, and, and UX. Um, and that's one of the things we're very happy to support. We want to double down in that area. Uh, most of the people giving support in the Bitcoin ecosystem are, are software focused. And I, again, I understand that for the reason, reasons I just explained, it's, it's mission critical. Um, but uh, there's not a whole lot of support for like Bitcoin communities, Bitcoin physical spaces, Bitcoin education, very little actually. Um, and that's what we'd like to see more out of from the community more broadly. You know, if you're giving money out, it, 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 it's great and you should do software for sure, but you should also do physical spaces, communities, conferences, uh, meetups, bit devs, like all these things are so, so, so important. Because right now Bitcoin's, Bitcoin's good enough. Uh, it works really well and it could accommodate hundreds of millions more people than it does right now without any changes at all. It's perfectly fine. And um, What's the barrier is not the software, it's, it's the people and the education. Right. So we need to find better ways of helping people understand that Bitcoin's not a waste, it's not a scam, it's not bad for the environment, it's not dangerous. In fact, <laughs> it's, it's the opposite of all those things. It's actually really good for people and the planet long term, we're going to realize that. Um, and, you know, we, it requires uh, more, more uh, public narratives in education for us to fight back against, honestly, media and the government that want us to think this thing is bad. So let's double down in this area of education, uh, first and foremost. Great, thank you. That brings us to the end of our panel session today. I want to thank each and every one of you who's given us the value of your time. Please approach any one of us if Thanks, you have everyone. any questions, we are happy to address. Thank you. Thank you.